everybody doing today? Everybody good? Come on, I hope you're doing good. Hi, I'm Teddy. It's amazing how fast time goes. It feels like I was just doing this like yesterday, and it's been seven days, but I'm glad to be back. It is a lot of fun and, and happy that God is moving and doing some things. I love what Travis threw out there to you. It's fun to see just what he did in January and what the rest of 2019's got. It's going to be absolutely incredible. Hey, can we give it up for everybody watching online right now? Thank you for watching. Glad you're watching. Praying God speaks to you today some way, form, or fashion. Really looking forward to what God's got. Hey, listen, before I dive into the message, um, let me just give you a couple things. If you're here and you're wondering, like, man, uh, I want to learn more about Desperation Church, or maybe you're here and you want to find out more about how to become, we call them owners, not as much members, but like membership, we call it ownership. Uh, I mean, I want to become more of an owner of Desperation Church. Listen, if that's you, we have Connect class right after this service and then right after the last service, okay? And it'll be right back here. Before you go through the sliding doors, there's a room to your right. You can go in there. We got a few little snacks for you. Probably won't last but an hour, hour and 15 minutes at the longest, all right? And so we're just going to give you some information about our church, help you understand a little bit more, and you can, you can make a decision there or later on if you want to, if you want to become an owner of Desperation Church, okay? So you can go and check it out whenever you're ready. Also, March the 10th, March the 10th, Put it on your calendar. If you are interested in helping us launch our North Jefferson West Blunt campus, we would love for you to come and be, be, come to an interest meeting. All right, we're having an interest meeting March the 10th. We'd love for you to come be a part of that. We're going to do it at our downtown campus at 2.30, okay? March 10th, 2.30, downtown campus. So if you're interested in helping us launch off in the September of 2019, prayerfully, if everything continues to go right, all right? Uh, if you want to help us launch off, we would love for you to come and be a part of that. So March 10th. 2.30 on our downtown campus. We're going to have a meeting, okay? Hey, um, we are going to go into our second week of our new series called Dress Codes. And I'm hoping and praying that God spoke to you last week. And we're coming out of Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. We're basically just taking four verses and we're breaking it down into three series. And, and what we're talking about is basically that God has a dress code for us. And so last week we talked about five pieces of clothing, all right, that God tells us to put on. And basically there's eight pieces of clothing. So today we're going to talk about two and the next week we're just going to talk about one, okay? So last week we talked about putting on tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Let me just read the scripture to you, all right? Colossians chapter three, verse 12 says this, and 13. Let me go and give you 13 too, where we're going to go today. It says, it says, God chose you to be the holy people he loves. You must clothe yourselves. Put on some new clothes. Don't put on, take off the old clothes that you wore of the flesh, of your old life, of, your, of life that was death. Put on new clothes, the new clothes of Jesus. You must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, what we talked about last week that I need you to understand all the way through this series is that all eight pieces of clothing are all articles of clothing of grace, the grace of God. There's no way that we can be the holy chosen people of God without the grace of God. And since God showed us grace, he has asked us to be horizontal and show other people grace, okay? So every piece of clothing that we're putting on is about other people. And you know, one thing I thought about this week, whatever I was kind of studying for this, is whenever you look throughout the script, scriptures, God tells us, on a, especially the New Testament, all right? Jesus tells us on a regular basis, the way that people know that you love me is by the way you love other people, all right? And so he gives us all kinds of things that we should do all throughout the New Testament in the way we love other people. And so he's telling us right here to put on tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, here's the other two articles of clothing we're talking about today. Make allowance for each other's faults. And somebody like, ugh, I don't like that, all right? And forgive anyone. Anyone is anyone. All right, we're all anyone. The person sitting next to you isn't anyone. The person you don't like isn't anyone. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, that's a big word. Remember, the Lord forgave you. So you must forgive others. So you must forgive others. So I want to talk to you today about forgiveness in relationships marriages, and honestly, really, with, with anyone we encounter in our lives who have hurt us, all right? All right listen, the, the world you live in today, uh, it, it, we live in a world full of people, all right? We live in a world with difficult people. We live in a world with people who are our best friends and our family members. It's usually the closest ones that hurt us and offend us. The Bible says that we all need to get along, and the only way we can really do that is to understand what true, total forgiveness looks like. All right, and so 
Today, we're going to talk about two articles of clothing, and we're going to talk about making allowance for each other's fault. We're going to talk about forgiveness, all right? So before we do that, because this is a strong subject, there's a lot of people in here that's going to try to resist everything that God wants to set you free from today. You cannot resist God. I do not resist what God wants to do in your life. Because what, listen, when you think that you got the upper hand, you're really the prisoner, all right? And so what we're praying for today is that God helps get you set free some way, form, or fashion, all right? So let's pray. Father, we love you. We praise you. We honor you and we lift you up. God, I ask in Jesus' name, God, the chains of, of, uh, of unforgiveness that are on people, the chains of anger and bitterness that has come from unforgiveness, Lord, I pray that those chains be, be, be removed today. God, I pray you start the process of taking those chains off of people and people start walking in true forgiveness and they learn what freedom really looks like. God, I pray that, God, you do something special in the lives of people today. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we honor you, and we thank you, Jesus, in your name. And everybody say amen. How many of you got siblings? Anybody got siblings in the house? You know what I'm talking about? How many of you fought with your siblings when you was growing up? Throw your hands up. How many of you still fought with your siblings? Throw your hands up. All right, come on. That's all of us. We all good? Hey, listen, uh, whenever I was growing up, me and my sisters, um, we, we, uh, we were basically latchkey kids. That's what they called them in the 80s. That's where both of your parents worked, so we got to stay at home by ourselves on a regular basis all the time, okay? So that does not make uh, good for being kind to one another. So when you're, when you're anywhere from, from 10 to 12 years old and you're by yourself at the house, there's going to be some, some ticked off kids, all right, some way, form, or fashion. And so m- me, Molly, and Ellery were always mean to each other some way, form, or fashion. All right? We were always fighting somehow or another. And one thing you got to understand about our family when we were growing up, especially when we were younger, we grew up really in a staunch legalistic uh, lifestyle, okay? We, we grew up in a way that, you know, you really, girls couldn't wear pants. Molly and Ellery wore culottes. They were made fun of all the time. So I'm glad Ashley liked that. If you don't know what culottes are, there's like a skirt, but shorts, all right? They're kind of split and the legs, bell-bottom shorts is what they look like, okay? And so if they wore shorts, so everybody looked at us at the weirdo, they're the weirdo kids. They're weird, man. Like, why can't you wear pants? Because it's, you're going to hell if you do. And so we'd tell kids that. We'd literally tell kids like, Oh, you got pants on? You're going to hell. All right, so listen. Anyway, that's what legalism does to you. That's why we're trying to help you get set free from it. All right, some of y'all laugh, but you may be there. Might not just be with kulaks, might be with something else. But the big picture is, is uh, you know, we couldn't really listen to rock and roll, all right? Uh, that's what they called it back in there, rock and roll. Anybody, anybody else grew up anything like that? Throw your hands up. You know, Dear Lord Jesus, uh, we all getting set free today, all right? Listen, so, so I had a secret, I had a secret, uh, I had a secret passion for rock and roll, and there was one dude that, honestly, I, I, there was two reasons why I secret about why I really liked him. Um, is number one, it was because if you like Michael Jackson and you was a dude, you was not cool. Right? You was looked at as not cool, and all the girls was raving over Michael Jackson, just thought he was absolutely incredible, and all the dudes like Michael Jackson is not cool at all. But secretly, every dude was in their closet or in their car listening to him. Don't you, don't you act like, just like all you 90s boys with your boy bands, all right? In sync, you know you in the car by yourself, bye, bye, bye. You know you was, all right? Come on, don't act like you all bad and cool. And so when I was by myself, man, I, and listen, this, this right here, this would come on, I want you to hang on. This would come on and I would go, listen, what, this is what would happen. This is my favorite song ever in the 80s. Listen, listen. Oh yeah, come on, y'all hear that? Y'all hear that? I would lose my ever loving mind. Like, ah! I'd be like Michael Jackson, like, you know. I'd be, I'd be moonwalking, I'd be like, what's up? You know, I would be like doing, okay, I, I can't do some of the dances he did because number one, I'd break my neck and some of them were really bad. But the big picture is, I, I would sing every word. Everybody wants to sing this really bad, don't you, right now? <laughs> Y'all like it? Okay, you can turn it off because we got to get spiritual in the house. We're going to hell. Listen. <laughs> and so I, 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 would, I, I would turn it up. Back in the day, it was I-95. Anybody, does anybody remember I-95? Cow, y'all are old. Listen. And so I remember I would lock the door and Michael Jackson, I'd be screaming, turn it, wow! I'd be dancing. And all of a sudden, you know what Molly would do? The tattletale? She'd run straight to the phone and pick it up and go, she'd dial mama's number at work. Like, mama, Andy's listening to rock and roll. And you think I'm lying. And I would go out and I'm still harboring bitterness towards her today. That's why I'm telling the story because I want her to feel it. All right? She's over here. I'm just kidding. No, but I would be mad. I'd be like, I would hang over and be like, why would you do that for? 
Lord, like, that's good. But secretly, she was listening to her own stuff. You know, I was, I just loved it. I would get in the bathtub and I would sing Prince and this is what it sounds like when the doves cry. Listen, <laughs> I would get whoopings for listen to rock and roll, I'd get told on and it'd make me mad and we would fight and I'd harbor bitterness. But thank you, Jesus, you set me free. And so I will help you get set free today. Thank you, Molly, for being an enemy. Listen, so it's amazing how it's the people we love the most that we end up hurting the most. It's absolutely amazing, especially marriages. It's absolutely amazing. The people that we love the most is the ones we end up hurting the most. Listen, in relationships, there will be pain, there will be fights, there will be mistakes, there will be serious problems at times. Things that can cause a lot of damage and it can really weather your relationships in big ways. And so a lot of times, honestly, you know, it's a whole nother message in and of itself. A lot of times we need to ask ourselves, am I the problem? See, a lot of times we always like to point the finger at other people when in reality, we all have our own blind spots. All of us have our own blind spots. Some of us know what our blind spots are, but we continue to walk in because we just like being that way, all right? Here's a, here's a very real truth that I need you to hear, okay? When two people in, in marriages or in relationships, definitely marriage, when two people have no end in mind, they can make it through anything. In other words, if you have something, if you have in your mind, if you're married today and you have in your mindset, well, I can get out of this. All I got to do is divorce him. If you, if you go into a marriage thinking that way, you'll never make it. It's never going to happen. But if you have in your mindset, this is my best friend in the world, or this is my husband, or this is my spouse or whatever, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to fight for our relationship to be good. And so I, I'm, I'm not going to have an end in mind. I, I'm, I'm going to be able to leave room for failures. For, I'm going to make allowances for faults. And we're going to learn how to get through this. We're going to talk more about that as we go. So here's what I need you to understand. Paul talks about in this passage that we are to choose forgiveness and to make allowances for each other's faults. And so I have three points today on, on forgiveness that I, I, I want you to not just hear, but I need you to apply it. I don't want you just to hear it. We need you to apply it, all right? Because I think all of us have probably heard messages on forgiveness and a lot of us are gonna just bow up on, I will not apply it until they apply it, all right? You are the one that's still in bondage. So, so if you really wanna walk in freedom and you really wanna enjoy the rest of your life, you really need to apply it some way, form or fashion. Now listen, once again, out of all the people in this room, I have no clue what's happening in everybody's life. All right? I have no clue the things that's happened to you. I know there are people in this room that's gone through some serious, serious stuff that you could be saying the whole entire time to me. You could be saying, hey, Andy, you have no clue what I've gone through. And you're right, I have no clue. But God does. And God knows that if you don't let them go, somebody, look, I'm not saying fist bump them, be their best friends, give them big bear hugs every time you see them. But what I am saying is that you gotta let them off the hook. And if you don't, they're going, to they're going to control you the rest of their life. Even if they're dead and gone, they could be dead. They could be six foot under the ground and still have control of your life and not even know it because you're not forgiving them yet, all right? So I believe everybody in this room wants to live in forgiveness some way, form or, I mean, wants to live in freedom some way, form or fashion. And I believe that unforgiveness is one of the number one things that keeps the majority of people in bondage. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that, all right? First point, number one, you've got to create a culture of many chances, create a culture of many chances. This is what verse 13a says. It says, make allowance, make allowance, make allowance for each other's faults. Hey, do you leave room for failure with other people in your life? Or do you look at people with a negative slant with basically just a speck in your eye? I mean, just, just a speck in their eye. Do you look for the little bitty things in their life that you can just grab hold of so that you can find something against them? Listen, if you really want to live a life of freedom and you want to have great relationships with people, then you've got to make a lot of allowance for people's failures. Because you fail people, I fail people, we all fail people. And so if we don't leave room for failure, 
You're not going to have many relationships in your life. <clears throat> Listen, how we consistently respond to problems is the culture we end up creating. I want to say it again. How we consistently respond to problems is the culture we end up creating. Listen, you could create a culture that is toxic with resentment and unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, because that's, listen, that's all things that stem from unforgiveness. But you could create a culture of giving many chances to people who have failed you in your relationships, in your home, at your work, uh, with your friend group. You, you could create a culture of giving people many chances or you can give them one chance and I'm done. I'm not getting hurt again. And you're gonna be a lonely person because to be honest with you, everybody's gonna fail you some way, form or fashion. Can I be honest? If you're here, if you're here today and you're visiting Desperation Church because you left a church that hurt you, there's a great possibility because there are people in this room right here that this church could hurt you some way, form or fashion. And guess what? When you hear me say that and you're like, well, if y'all gonna hurt me, then I ain't going back to that church. Well, then the church you go to after that is gonna hurt you. Why? Because there's a great possibility people in that church are gonna hurt you. Why? Because we're all fallen and we're good at failing people. Everybody has got the case. You failed people. I failed people. We've all failed people. So this is a place where we've got to make up in our minds that in relationships with others, I'm going to let them off the hook for being human. I'm going to let them off the hook for being human. Can I ask you a question? Did you marry God? Now, your husband may think he's God, <laughs> but he's not. Did you marry God? Listen, your friends are not God and your spouse and your friends will make devastating mistakes and so will you. Why, why will you? Because you're human, we're all human. So we need to live lives of many chances. You know what drives me crazy and I think I've told y'all this before is, look, I'm a really bad, I told y'all I'm a bad driver, all right? Some of y'all have seen me. I, I've got somebody videoing me, which by the way, they're a bad driver because they were driving when they videoed me, all right? Uh, running off the road and stuff. Like, dude, you need to drive. Are you drinking like you're a drunk pastor? No, I'm not. I'm just a bad driver. And so I, I get honked at a lot, all right? I get honked at a lot and, and uh, you know, it's kind of hard in Coleman driving because the roads are crazy when you got little tiny lanes and stuff and they, you're scared they're gonna hit your mirrors and all that kind of stuff. You pull them in while you're sitting at the red light and put them back out when you go. But the big picture is, is it drives me crazy. Uh, and this is probably people in here, when, when, when you do something like you shouldn't do, all right? And somebody lays on the horn at you and some of them give you the number one sign, the old peel banana, you know what I'm saying? Listen. They holler at you, they cuss you, they say things to you. Like, wah, 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 wah. And I want to just kind of get my own, my own little police light out and pull them over, all right? Just pull them over. Just, if I could do it, like a citizen's arrest, citizen's arrest. I pull them over and ask them a question. Just, I, I got one question. Have you ever made a mistake driving or are you the perfect driver that's ever been? Now, you know, there's people in this room that get angry at other people driving. How many get, how many is, Listen, if you're sitting close to somebody in the realm of you that's an angry driver, raise your hand, throw your hands up. Oh, dear God. <laughs> this message is for you. You've honked your horn at me, and I'm telling you I'm the citizen of arrest. I'm telling you right now. You have made a mistake. You have made a mistake. How, how many of you have made a mistake driving some way, form, or fashion? Throw your hands up. Quit honking your horns at people. Just love them like, love you. Thank you, Jesus, for these people. All right, listen. The big picture is, is in the same way, I'm, I'm making a joke about driving, but the big picture is this. In the same way that you've made mistakes driving and you really can't get too angry at other people who really cut you off or do things, uh, you know, is the same way in life. In the same way that you have failed people, in the same way that you have hurt people, in the same way that people have been hurt by you, you need to leave room for, for, for forgiveness with others because they're gonna fail you. So you've got to go, you, there's gotta be a place where you recognize and understand, you know what? I'm not perfect and I've made mistakes too. In the same way that you want people to forgive you, you extend forgiveness towards others. This is what it says in Matthew 18, 21 to 22. It says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Back in the day, they used to think that I can forgive somebody three times and after that, I'm good to go. So Paul, I mean not Paul, but Peter thinks he's being super spiritual when he looks at Jesus and he says, should I do it seven times? Because three was, the, you know, that was the quota. So he's trying to sound super, should I do it seven times? 
And Jesus like, ha, 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 no. He says, no, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. What Jesus is saying, he's saying, live a life that gives people many chances because people will fail you. Why do you do that? Because they need them. They need chances in order to get better. And so do you. You need chances. We all need chances. You leave room for fault. Make allowance for other people's fault. You don't just change in an event. Sometimes it's a process. You don't just change in an event. A lot of times it's a process. You know, that could go for forgiveness because some of you have been hurt so bad. For a lot of you, sometimes it's just gonna be a process of forgiving people. It's a process. Now, a lot of people are like, it should be like one and done. Forgive them. And, you, and if you, listen, I know for some people, you need to ask God to help you with forgiveness every single day. Some people disagree with that and they can disagree with me if they want to. But I understand how, how deep pain can go when it comes to people being hurt. And sometimes it's an everyday deal. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to forgive my spouse or I pray you'd help me to forgive this person. I pray you today, every single day, God, help me to lay at your feet and move forward. It's a process. Point number two is forgive and remember. Uh Uh-oh, that's a little different. Forgive and remember. Verse 13a says, I mean, verse 13b says, and forgive anyone who offends you. Forgive anyone who who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. You know, I think a lot of us have, um, have a bad definition of forgiveness. Forgiveness does not make what happened to you okay. It does not. It does not make what happened to you okay. It's not okay, and it never will be okay. All right, let's just get that straight. But forgiveness is setting someone else free. And if you hold on to unforgiveness and do not let them off the hook, do not help them get, uh, you know, walk away from freedom, then guess who the prisoner is? You. You're the prisoner. You're building your own prison. Forgiveness brings healing to a broken relationship. Listen, this is not an event. It's a process. It's an everyday choice to no longer want to make the person pay or suffer for the hurt they caused you. Listen, there's a lot of people, and I've, 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 I feel like I preach on forgiveness about once or twice a year because it's such a big deal. I probably should preach on it more. It's such a big deal. And so there's a lot of things that I'll say that's a lot of the same stuff because it's just true. You know, there are people in this room that feel like because I'm harboring bitterness and because I will not forgive this person who has offended me or hurt me very bad, I will not like them I will stay angry with them. I, listen, you literally feel like you have power over them. You really feel like you have the upper hand over them because I'm not going to forgive them. When in reality, they still have power over you. They still have the upper hand over you. Why? Because you still think about them every waking hour of the day. You go to bed thinking about hating them and you wake up thinking about hating them. And all it does is in your inner man, that unforgiveness turns to bitterness. And it, listen, it turns into bitterness. It can turn into rage. It can turn into gossip. It turns into anger. And what happens is it it begins to give you a slanted eye, not only towards one people, one person, but it causes you to start looking at other people with that same slanted eye. It begins to hurt other relationships because I'm really angry at one person. And whenever you think you've got the upper hand, and look at what I'm doing to them. I'm, I am doing everything I can to let them know you've hurt me. When in reality, you're the one that's hurt because you got to let them off the hook. You got to let them go. And they're still controlling your life. You're still controlled by a wound that's happened that's never healed. You've never allowed God to heal the wound inside of you. And God knows if you continue to hold on to unforgiveness, God knows that if you continue to hold on to unforgiveness, that it will be dangerous, more dangerous in your life than it will be to forgive them. 
It's good to humble yourself and to forgive than to be prideful and hold on to unforgiveness because it's damaging. It will destroy your life. So anybody in this room that thinks you got the upper hand because I'm, 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 I'm holding this against them and they know it and I'm gonna let them know it, you're the one that's in prison. You're in a prison. You're chained up. You're shackled. You ain't going nowhere. You stuck. And honestly... Jesus has the key ready to give it to you to get out of your prison, but you're too stubborn to take it from him. There's people in this room that hates their life because somebody's hurt you, but, the, but you think the reason why you hate your life is because that person hurt you, but in reality, you're still harboring unforgiveness towards them. That's why you're hating life, where you can really enjoy life when you let them off the hook. Let them go. There's a whole bunch we could talk about that. True forgiveness is no longer wanting the wrong done to you to be correct, corrected or paid for, all right? True forgiveness is no longer wanting the wrong done to you to be corrected or paid for. I want them to pay for what they've done to me. So I will pay with what they've done to me with a cold shoulder, not answering their phone calls, not returning their texts. I'm, I'm gonna let them know. Resentment nurtures the damage. Resentment nurtures the damage. You know, this is where a lot of us hang out most of the time. And honestly, we, we, we end up trying to make a relationship or marriage work with bitterness in our hearts and it will never, ever work. It doesn't work. It won't work, never will work. With resentment in your heart, it won't work. So let me just give you a few ways. Well, let me ask, have you ever wondered if you've truly forgiven somebody. Like I wonder, like, I've tried to forgive them. I wonder if I've really truly forgiven somebody. Well, by the way, when I go through these, I need you to understand it's still a process. I'm not giving you a way out, but I need you to understand it's still a process for a lot of people. So here's some ways to know uh, if, you, if you haven't forgiven somebody. Here's some ways to know you haven't forgiven somebody. If you're wondering, let me just give you a few things. There's just a few, we can give a lot more, there's just a few. Do you talk neg negatively about them to people uh, or do you talk negatively about them on social media in order to get people to view them the way you see them? In other words, it's basically gossip. The person that has offended you and hurt you, do you talk about them on a regular basis negatively to get other people to view them the same way you do? Because you want them on your side. Hey, let me go in. I want you to hear me. I've said this a thousand times and you could agree with me or disagree with me if you want to. But I want you to hear me. The more negative you talk about somebody, no matter what they've done to you, this is why I think it's incredibly smart to remain silent in a lot of stuff. The more negative you talk about people that has hurt you, the more it gets in your bones. When you start letting things get deep into your bones and in your inner man, the more you talk about it, the deeper it gets. The more you talk about it, the deeper it gets. The more you talk about it and speak about it, the deeper it gets. The more people you talk to it about it that you want on your side, the deeper it gets. And the worse it becomes. To where what we need to do is to take it to one or two people who understand fallenness, who understands depravity, who understands people hurt people and then take it to God and let somebody speak life into you let, instead of letting somebody agree with you and just tell you all the nasty things you need to do towards this person. That's really bad advice because all it's doing is making you a worse person. I don't know if that makes sense. I sure hope it does. But I've learned over my life, just for anything that's scary, if, like, if I get fearful about something, if there's something in my life, that I, I've, not even people in general, but if I begin to talk about it all the time to different people or to my wife or just talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, next thing I know is so deep inside of me that it begins to own me and I get consumed with it and I begin to walk in lots of anxiety and honestly it can lead to a lot of depression and worry and freaking out. And what it, what it, really, what it really reveals is, is that I really don't trust God with this situation. What it reveals whenever you're talking to other people is that you're not taking it before God, you're taking it to other people to get them on your side and really you're not trusting God to handle the person that's offended you or hurt you. And to, honestly, to help you. I'm really fixing to open some of you eyes here in just a second. So 
How do you know if you've forgiven somebody or not? Do you still view them through pain? Do you still view them through your pain? In other words, when somebody has hurt us, now look, once again, this is a process. This is easy for Pastor Andy to say, but this is where, God, I want you to take me on this journey. This is where I want you to take me. Do you view them the way Jesus sees them? Do you view them the way Jesus sees them? You know, I was, um, this is gonna make some people mad, but I, you, I, you gotta understand Jesus. He's like, oh God, I can't wait. Y'all just tuned in right there. Y'all woke up, I like got off your cell phones. This is good. What's he got? You know, uh, a couple weeks ago, they signed into, um, New York signed the abortion law. Third trimester, which made me more, I mean, like, I was sick to my stomach. I was angry. I was mad. I want to get picket signs. I want to go just let my, my voice be known. This is what the Lord spoke to me. Andy, all them people that are applauding and all those people that signed those dotted papers, I love them just as much as I love you. I love them. So that's going to make some people mad because like, he don't love them. Yes, he does. He died for them. And then there's people in this room that's probably thinking like, well, why don't you stand up and talk about it more in church? Because I want to tell you something. There are women in this room right here and men also who have gone through abortions that nobody else knows about in this room right here. They're scared to death. I start preaching hardcore, like, yeah, I hate hard. All it's going to do is cause more guilt and shame in their life. And they already think the church hates them. When in reality, we need to be the ones reaching out to them and loving them. And you can disagree with me all day long. I'm more about the person than I am the issue. We're going to be about people. And if there's people, ladies in this room that you've gone through that, we love you. And if you feel guilt and shame over that, we love you. We want to help you if you'll let us with the guilt and the shame. And we want to walk with you. All right? People, Jesus and people will always come above issues. Should always come above issues. So that's my two cents. All right, let's move on. I won't plan on saying that. I just did. Listen, do you still bring it up in heated arguments? So you say you've forgiven your spouse, but anytime you get in a big brawl, you always bring it up. You know what I'm saying? Not good. If so, there's a great possibility. Oh, do their names or the side of them make you sick? Like when you're going through the grocery store at Publix or Walmart and they're walking down the same aisle, you're like, oh, dear Lord Jesus, let me go down this aisle right here. Let me get out of here. Like, you, I mean, you, you getting on that, you, you ever seen the people, old people at the mall walk? I, I call it the mall walk. Like they walk, walk, I don't know how they do it. Anyway, they do it. They're, okay, I'm gonna move on. All right, that's really awkward. Listen, you, you're moving out the way. You don't wanna get around them. Good possibility you may not have forgiven them completely. And God wants you to completely forgive them. Somebody say, well, Andy, I... I forgive them when I'm ready. Uh, can I tell you something? You'll never be ready. You'll never be ready. You choose forgiveness now and your feelings will follow later. It's not about the way you feel. You choose, forgiveness is a choice. You choose to forgive now and your feelings will follow later. Listen, it's not a matter if they deserve forgiveness. It's a matter of how much do you want the relationship to be healed? You know, whenever we think about, whenever you think about forgiveness and people that's hurt you, you kind of think about them being your enemies. I mean, they become like an enemy. We know what Jesus says about enemies. I read a book a while, a long time ago and I did a, I did a, um, a series, I think, it was at, I think it was somewhere else. I don't even think it was at our church. I may need to do this at our church at some point. It was on a book called Total Forgiveness. And so I, I was looking at one of my old sermons on forgiveness the other day just to see some things that I'd said. Because number one, I don't want to repeat the things I've said before uh, as much, but I also want to just say, but there were some things that I, I had wrote. And so I, I just kind of want to read to you about enemies, all right, about having enemies in your life. And this came from a book by R.T. Kendall called Total Forgiveness. And I think everybody in this room probably needs to forgive it. Forgive it? <laughs> you need to forgive the book. No, you need to read it, all right? So Total Forgiveness, Matthew 5, says, but I say, love your enemies. This is Jesus talking. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Don't pray for God's wrath to fall on them. <laughs> pray in a kind way. Pray for those who persecute you. Now, there may be people in this room asking, what is an enemy? What's an enemy? 
It's a person who either wants to harm you or who would say something about you so as to call your credibility or integrity into question. They would rejoice at your downfall or lack of success. Their prayer is not for your blessing, but that God would bring you down. Enemies will take unfair advantage of you. They will despitefully use you. They will walk all over you. If they know you place vengeance in God's hands, in other words, God, I trust you, rather than your own, instead of, instead of respecting this, they will exploit it all the more, knowing you will not retaliate. An enemy will often persecute you. The Greek word for persecute means to follow or to pursue. Enemies will pursue you because they are obsessed with you. Their main tactic is to discredit you. They will tear you down to the boss to keep you from getting the raise. They will tell your friends about any indiscretions they might perceive. They will go out of their way to keep you from succeeding and from being admired. What's more is if they are Christians, they may deceive themselves into thinking that they are doing it for God and his glory. John 16, two says this about the religious leaders. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. Now, some of you may be sitting there listening to this and thinking like, yeah, I know that person towards me. I know exactly who that person is towards me. Can I flip it around and ask you, who are you? What person in your life are you like that to? Because remember, we all make mistakes. I, I think it would prob probably do us better if we started thinking like, who am I? Who do I want to see? Who am I going on the, on, in the name of Jesus? Who am I going in the name of Jesus? Using God as a crutch to not like somebody. Which by the way, that's kind of dangerous, I believe. I wouldn't do that. At least I hope I wouldn't do that. Let me just rephrase that because I know my fallenness. Anybody can do that. Here's what I need you to understand. So you just saw John 62 says that it's going to happen to Christians. Even, even in church, people will come against you in the name of Jesus, thinking they're, thinking they're doing something great for the glory of God, when in reality, they're deceived. And it could be somebody in this room right here towards other people in this room. Here's what I need you to understand. This is what Matthew 5, 11 through 12 says. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and says all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Like, what? Like, are you crazy? Be happy when people mock me and persecute me and talk bad about me? He says, yeah, be happy. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So here's what, here's what I would say to you. You got somebody that's coming against you. Somebody that's lying against you. Understand and realize that if you have an enemy like this, you need to treasure it. Not everyone is that blessed. You should take that person's picture, enlarge it, frame it, and thank God every time you look at it because your enemy, should, ha should you handle him or her correctly, could turn out to be the best thing that ever happened to you. It's hard to believe. I want you to listen to me. The chief motivation to forgive is not only the mercy that will be extended to us, but also the great reward that is promised when we forgive people. The, listen, listen. The greater the hurt, the greater the blessing that will come with forgiveness. Not only in the future life, but in this life today. Today. The greater the hurt, the greater the blessing that will come with forgiveness. When you have totally forgiven your enemy, you have crossed over into the supernatural realm. When you know someone is out to destroy you and discredit you, you are very, very blessed. Why? Because this doesn't happen to everyone. Listen, I want you to hear me. Some of y'all, I mean, preacher, you done lost your mind. Well, you tell that to Jesus because Jesus is the one that told us that in Matthew chapter five. Listen to this. For behind your enemy is the hand of God. God has raised up your enemy possibly just for you. Part of David's preparation for king was having Saul pursue him to kill. God knows the worst thing that could happen to a man or a woman is to succeed before they're ready. Remember, remember King Saul chased David for 13 years before David took the throne. He was crowned king 12. 
years before took the throne, but God was preparing him, maturing him, making him ready to be the king. Totally forgiving an enemy is about the highest level of spirituality that exists. This is as good as it gets. It is as spectacular as any miracle. Loving an enemy defies natural explanation. Totally forgiving anyone who has hurt you and the blessing is beyond words to describe. Jesus says, love your enemies. He assumed that we would have one or more and most people do. Sadly, most, if not all, will be from the community of faith. Much persecution comes from those who claim to believe in God as much as you. Your enemy may not be able to cope with you being the way you are or with being a particular side of a certain issue, but you cannot be angry with your enemy. It is God who is at work on your heart. Some of you may not like, but God's at work on your heart. Why? Because he's trying to teach you how to carry tender heart and mercy, humility, all the articles of clothing we've talked about, gentleness. When God has, when you have enemies in your life, God is using that some way, form, or fashion to make us more like God. If you respond right. God designs an enemy to keep us on our toes and on our knees. He is sovereign. He knows exactly what we need. He will keep our enemy alive and, and well as long as we need them to make us more like Jesus. And hopefully he's gonna make that person more like Jesus. Whether your enemy is temporary or for life, never forget that God is at the bottom of it all. While their motives may be a carnal, carnal God's motives are for sanctification. Hey, one of the greatest ways to become more like Jesus is to have somebody in your life that doesn't like you. And how you respond says a lot about you. I gotta move, I gotta move, I gotta move quick. So the reality of it is, is that the, the, the ones that hurt you, they don't have to pay for their wrongs is, is because Jesus already did. Jesus, listen, Jesus paid for your sins, he paid for theirs. It's amazing how we love grace for us, but we have a really hard time extending it to other people. We have a really hard time extending it to other people. Now, here's what I need you to understand is that everybody here, some way, form or fashion has scars. When we really understand what it means to forgive because the Lord forgave us, it will cause us to see the ones who hurt us like Jesus sees humanity. When you open yourself up to this process, he will give you his eyes for people. The point is called forgive and remember. Listen, we have always been taught to forgive and forget, but sometimes forgiving is remembering. Remembering what you've, been, what you've been through together. Remembering what was meant to break you, God used to build you because you chose to do it His way. Remember, it also calls you to remember that Jesus forgave you. So since Jesus forgave me when I didn't deserve it, I will forgive this person also. A healthy marriage, a healthy friendship is not one that is absent of problems. But two people who become very good at forgiving is a healthy relationship. And it's also a relationship that has many scars. Not wounds, scars. Point number three, very quick. Wear your scars proudly. Maybe you're here today and you're married. Let's just talk about marriage. Maybe your marriage has wounds. But did you know that one day they could be scars? depends on how, on how you handle it. A lot of you got open, open emotional wounds all over you because of your marriage. But one day they can be scars if you let God heal them. Do you know all scars tell a story? Scars tell stories. What once was so painful and devastating at the time is now a story of healing. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, your marriage has scars. Or maybe your relationships have scars. You know, maybe, you know, I got scars all over me. I, I don't have time to tell you all the scars, stories. I've told y'all before, I mean, in other messages that I preach, uh, but I've got scars on the back of my legs from cutting it with a knife. I've got, I've got my lip was busted right here from hitting uh, uh, the back of a seat in a, in a, in a bus called the Old Glory Special, um, which is really weird. Uh, I, got, I got stitches here and stitches here, one from hitting a coffee table and one from hitting a big all gas tank playing capture the flag uh, with a church cam, which is really crazy. And listen, every, every scar I've got on my body has got a story. And in the same way, every marriage that has wounds that are in pain 
can one day have a scar. And with that scar, you have a story that you could tell other people to help them heal with, it, get healed with. It. Some of you may have a scar of, hey, my spouse bounced a check or overdrew a bank account knowing you, that you are incredibly low in the bank account and you're working hard to make ends meet, but yet my, my spouse still bounced the check, still did exactly what I asked them not to do. Remember, one of the number one things people fight about in marriages is money. So scar number one. Maybe another scar, scar number two. A spouse called you hurtful things for years. Got scars all over me from all the things that I've been called and told. Maybe scar number three, maybe you, you caught your husband looking at pornography. That's a big scar, boy. How do I heal this? Man, hey, what about the big scar? I mean, whoa, big one. The scar of infidelity. And how do I, how do I get past that? I mean, like, can anybody get past that? Listen, there is nothing more attractive and hope given than a marriage that's been through it. And it's better on the other side of it. If your marriage has a story and other people don't know it, then you need to share it. You need to wear it proudly. It will give others hope that they can not only survive, but they can thrive. See, there are people in this room right here who, are, who, who had in mind, they had in their mind, we have no end. And we will get through everything that we can together because of Jesus. And there are people in this room who've got scars all over them because of relationship, because of marriage. And then we got younger couples in here, maybe even older couples in here who have wounds all over them that you have not allowed God to heal. It would be great if some way, form or fashion, you could connect with somebody in this room right here who has got scars all over them because they were healed with the same wounds that you're experiencing right now. And let God help you. See, scars have stories. And when you begin to tell people the stories that you've gone through and they're going through the exact same thing, God can use these people in your life to help you with their story. That not only did they survive it, but now they're thriving through it. And you can too. Why? Because they responded with Jesus. They learned to forgive. Do you know Jesus wore his scars proudly? That's what it says in John 20, 20. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. What did he show them? He showed them the scars. Jesus wears his scars proudly to show us how to truly do relationships. Do you know Jesus has scars because of us? And now he shows them to us proudly because this is what I've done for you. This will bring life to you. You can thrive because of my scars. Even though we would turn our backs on him at times, we'd tell him no and tell ourselves yes. We'd praise him on Sunday and live a life that says otherwise throughout the week. Even through it. Even though it was our sin that created those scars, those scars have a story. And the story is through Jesus, I have forgiven you and I choose you. And he calls us to do the same. His scars. And in the same way that God has forgiven us and proudly wears the scars, it's the same way that we should forgive others. Let God heal the wounds, the great physician. Wear the scars proudly and help other brothers and sisters in Christ who are carrying wounds so that they can get doctored up and turn into scars. Why? Because that's what Jesus did for us. That's right. Y'all with me? That's what Jesus did for us. Walking who God's called us to be, okay? Listen, I know, boy, it's so, so much easier for Andy to stand up here and say this stuff, having no clue what y'all have gone through. I have no clue, but God does. And God really wants to heal you. I promise you. And as long as you hold on to harboring unforgiveness and bitterness, God can't use you the way he wants to use you. And there are other people in this room that are in chains that God wants to use you to help them get set free, but he can't, you can't help other people get set free until you get set free. And I have no clue what you're going through. And I, I try to say that as nice and as sweet and as loving as I can. I know God wants to set you free. And you start with forgiving, letting them off the hook. Let them off the hook, let them go. Start pursuing Jesus, okay? I know it's a process, but you can do it, all right? You can do it, I promise. You can do it. Let's pray. Father, we love you.